John Company is a game from Cole Worley and Sierra Madre Games. It's a lot of things. It's historical, strategic, full of nonsense garbage arguments, and it's also hard to learn. Honestly, I don't know why it's hard to learn. It's pretty straightforward. It's not the most complicated game there is, but it is. It's hard to learn. I, I had a real hard time learning it at first. I wish that there were a video or some kind of a tutorial on how to play the game before you start. So that's why I'm making this. I mostly know how to play now. I think I know how to play. So I'm going to teach you. Let's go through. Check it out. Okay, so I've got this game set up right now for the early company scenario. Because to me, that seems like it's the sort of regular game. It starts at the start. It can go through everything the game has to offer. We aren't going to do the campaign game. So let's remove these two cards before moving forward. That's Revoke Monopoly and Monopoly Revoked. Uh, these only come up in different scenarios or in the campaign. So we're not doing that, so let's get rid of them. So the objective of John Company is to gain victory points. The most common way to do that is by scoring prize cards. So I've put six of them down here at the bottom of the board. Each one has a little hexagon at the top with a number in the middle. That denotes how many points they're worth at the end of the game. Some of them also have abilities. So if you look at this House of Commons card, you'll see it has a hex at the top that reads two. That means for every cube you put in there, and you can put more than one, you will get two victory points at the end of the game. The cost is on the lower right. If you are a senior office holder, you will have to spend five pounds to take this. If you are an executive, you have to only spend three. Not all cards are available to all positions, and so it is worth looking at that and seeing which kind of cards you'll even be able to claim when you retire. A round of John Company is played out over four phases. The family phase, company phase, the trade phase, and the evening post. In the family phase, each player will perform one family action. Those are the ones, like I said before, outlined in a frilly purple pattern. They each can be taken as many times as the player wants, provided they can afford the price in the red circle, and the space itself does not say otherwise. For example, the manor here says that there is a one cube per game turn limit, whereas a shipyard does not have that restriction. Writer, officer, and captain don't cost any money, but each has a limit of two cubes per round for each player. And that's it. Once every player has taken an action, the family phase is over. Let's move on. Moving on now to the company phase. We're going to follow this big red band around the side of the board. The one here that says the company phase in big old letters. These first four actions are mandatory, which is denoted by the fact that these squares down here are green. Green means mandatory in this stage. For example, the ship's purchaser has the ability to purchase ships from the shipyards down here. They must spend as much of their money as they can in their treasury buying ships. And that's it. That's their only available action. These first few actions are remarkably similar in that regard, so you might get a little bit of deja vu. So like I had said before, the ship's purchaser must purchase ships from this little box down here. They have to buy the cheapest ones first, and the price they spend in each row is the highest number shown. So in this first one, they would spend four pounds, in the second one, five, as well as the third one, and in this fourth row, they would spend six. Again, they have to buy the cheapest ones available first, though. It's also worth saying that the players that own some of these shipyards get money if their ships are the ones that are purchased. For example, in this first row, orange and blue would get one pound if that ship is the one that's purchased. In the second row, orange would get one pound for that ship being bought. They take that from the bank and uh, not from the treasury here. Once purchased, any ships bought are sent over to the director of trade here, and the money is sent to the bank. Goods purchasing over here works very similarly to ships purchasing in that the player that is in the office must spend as much money as they can purchasing goods down here. If the players have their goods bought, they get the price of the good instead of a flat $1. At the start of the game, the price of goods is 2, as is noted in the discard pile for the evening postcards. As the game goes on, though, and evening postcards are discarded, the price will change, 
as will be noted on the top right of the card. With this card, it would change the cost to $1. As with ships purchasing, the goods are taken off of here and they are sent over to the Director of Trade for distribution later. Up next is military affairs. And tell me if you've heard this before. They must spend all of their money purchasing things from the board. They work similarly to goods purchasing in that they purchase goods. Works exactly the same. They buy goods. If they get it from players, the money goes to the player instead of the bank. However, military affairs has one advantage that the goods purchasing does not. They get to determine where the things they buy go. So let's say they purchase two goods for $4. Now they have this logistics action in addition to the purchasing action. What that means is they get to send these goods, now known as guns, to the various presidencies on the board. We haven't gotten to presidencies yet, and so I'm not gonna get too into what these do, but I'll say they will take them and they will put them on the upper right section of the presidencies to note that they are part of their army. And like I said, they are now considered guns, which is important. Starting in round two, the military affairs office will also have officers to distribute. They work the same way as guns, essentially, they get sent up to presidencies. At the end of every round, any officers here will be put into the military affairs area for distribution. But again, that doesn't happen on round one, so don't worry about that immediately. Next up is the director of trade. Now, similarly to military affairs, the director of trade has the logistics action. However, they don't get to purchase things like the military affairs did. They use the goods sent to them by the ship's purchaser and the goods purchaser. Similarly to military affairs, they will be sending these things to the presidencies, but they don't go to the armies. They instead go directly to the presidents, like so. Up next is the three presidencies and we only need to go over one of them because they all share the same three actions and you only need to learn one and you'll know all of them. After that, you will know about 80% of John Company. It's pretty easy, right? Something too to think about, just so you have some context, I guess, while you're trying to learn the game, is to imagine that the bottom half of the board feeds up into the top half of the board. That's to say the goods purchasing, ships purchasing, military affairs, and director of trade, all of their actions ultimately funnel up to the presidencies for use in the various regions of India. Everything in John Company connects to another action. And so I think having some context and thinking about how the things connect to one another really helps with not only learning the game, but playing it too. Anyway, let's move on to the presidencies. Each presidency office has their choice of three separate actions, campaign, open trade, and sale. These are all optional, so you could take all of them, none of them, just one or two, it's your choice. The fact that they're optional is indicated by the, the, the blue coloring on these squares, as opposed to the green coloring on the earlier actions. The only restriction is that you must follow the order that the black arrows point, which is to the left. So what that means is if you want to campaign, you'd have to do that before either of the other two actions. If you opened up your turn with open trade, let's say, you could sail afterwards, but you could not campaign afterwards. So while you don't have to do all these, you do have to do them in order. Okay, so let's go over these actions, starting with campaign. Campaigning allows you to dominate a region, installing a new office, and changing how the region will act towards events that come up in India at the end of a turn. To do this, you will roll one die per gun and officer in the army of that presidency. You may also spend two pounds to hire mercenaries. It's two pounds per mercenary, and they act just like a gun or an officer in that they add an extra die to your roll. Once you have the amount of uh, dice you're gonna use on your attack, you will subtract the defense value of the region. In the case of Bombay, it would be one. So let's say you committed one gun and spent, let's say four pounds to hire two mercenaries. So that's a total of three minus one would be two. So you would then roll two dice. You then simply roll and hope that the lowest die is a one or a two. If it is, you succeed. 
You then install the appropriate governor, in this case it would be the governor of Bombay, and you place it over the region like this, covering up that right side of the card. If the lowest number would be a five or a six, however, it is considered a failure. You do not install the governor card, and in fact, the uh, player who controls that presidency is immediately fired. They are not allowed to score, and no further actions in this presidency may be taken this turn. If the lowest result is a three or a four, nothing happens. The second action is opening trade. Opening trade allows you to gain access to closed regions, which are the cards to the left side of the board. To do this, you will pick one of the regions over on the side of the board, and then you will roll dice based on the amount of money you spent. You do not use guns or officers for opening trade. So you'll roll one die per pound that you spend. There is no penalty for this roll, so you'll roll as many dice as you choose to buy. And remember, company actions always come from the treasury, not from the family. The results are the same as campaigning. A one or a two is a success, bringing that region into this presidency. It would go up here, not blocking the side, but kind of alongside Bombay. And uh, five or six, once again, would fire the office holder there. Three or four, no change. Finally, the last action is sailing. Sailing works basically the same as open trade. You will spend one dollar and that will give you a die to roll. And you can do that as many times as you wish, provided you have the money in the family treasury. The difference here is that you do suffer a penalty if there's more than one region in this presidency. The penalty will be the total number of regions minus one. So initially it's one region minus one is zero. If you were to open a new, uh, a new region here, it would then be two minus one, which would be a penalty of one. Again, taking away from the amount of dice you'll roll. On a one or a two, you succeed just as before, and you will be able to sail to uh, the, the regions that you have available and sell to them. Those are the numbers up here. In this case, uh, Bombay wants spices and lemonies. You need to be able to satisfy this with a certain number of goods and ships, and you may never spend more goods than ships in this order. You can kind of think of it as the ships having the uh, capacity to carry goods, and if you have too many goods but not enough ships, you can't carry them all to your destination. So with Bombay, to satisfy their demand for spices, you could send two ships, and that is enough to satisfy this two. You will take one of these black discs and cover that up. You will then raise the company revenue by the number indicated in this circle, which in right now is five. Revenue is vital to keeping the company running, and so the sale action is one of the more important actions every round. You may not campaign or open trade, but you will almost certainly sail, otherwise you risk tanking the company. Whenever you successfully sail and satisfy demand in a region, the value of the demand that you're satisfying will raise the company revenue up to the amount that you sold. So the example before, selling spices for five pounds would raise the company revenue to five. Okay, so now we're moving into the trade phase of the game. And this one's pretty procedural. The rulebook does a good job of covering it, so I'm not gonna get into much detail here. The only thing I'll mention that uh, I certainly missed the first couple of times is taxes only get paid to provincial offices, meaning governorships or residencies. You have to have dominated a region with campaigning before you can collect tax money from it. The rest of this stuff is all pretty automatic, uh, especially the second part. This is really just upkeeping things that you auto owe money for, and that all comes out of the company revenue. The last part is something that the chairman is obligated to do, but they have some control over where it goes. This is where you distribute the rest of your money in the company revenue to different treasuries on the board, as well as potentially paying dividends, which is how players can gain money if they control shares in the company. 
Like I said, the rulebook covers all this stuff pretty well and it's very procedural, so I, uh, I'm not gonna cover it beyond that. Okay, and final phase of a round is the evening posts. You will begin this by flipping over the top card of this deck and placing it down here. There are three pieces to these cards that need to be satisfied, starting with the upper left, events in India, moving right to attrition, and ending with this event on the bottom, which can either be a law or an event that automatically comes into play. So let's start with this part right here. This is where the elephant is gonna move around the board. When the elephant moves, it will affect various regions of India, depending on where it currently is and where it's gonna go. When resolving events in India, we are going to move this elephant across the various regions in ascending order based on the numbers on the top of the cards. It starts in Punjab, and the event we drew had a two on it, so it will move two spaces. Again, it only resolves events when it moves to a region, not when it is in a region. So Punjab, we will not roll for. The first move will take it from number one to number two in Maratha, and then we will roll one of the dice and resolve the event on the right side of the card. Once that is resolved, we will go from number two to number three, because again, the event card we drew had a number two on it, so it will move two times. Same thing, we're gonna roll a die and then resolve the event on the right side of the board that corresponds to that die. These are all listed in the rulebook. I'm not gonna go over all of them right now. You might notice that there are two columns of events here. That is because depending on if a region is dominated or not, you will resolve from a different side. So Punjab over here is not dominated because there's nothing covering this side of the, of the card. So that's the event you're gonna use. On Mysore, on the other hand, that column on the right side is covered, meaning it's dominated, and you will resolve the left showing column over here. The various regions will act differently to the uh, in events in India based on if it's dominated or not. Okay, so up next are these attrition rolls, and this is where the executives on the board will potentially be able to retire and score prize cards to get them points. Starting here with the chairman, and following the purple ribbon around the board, each held office will roll one die. And depending on the result, which is listed out here on the card, they will be able to retire and score points or stay in office and keep their position held. Finally, we will deal with the law or event on the bottom of this card. In this instance, it's a law. Okay, so for laws, You'll start off with a popular support, which you will adjust down here with this cube. Take it and put it on the popular support number, which in this instance is minus three. So you'll cover that up right there. Next is the name of the law that you'll be voting on, 10 year limitations in this example, and what it does. Increase the result of all attrition rolls by one. So when office holders are potentially retiring, it will be easier if this passes. And finally on the bottom, it says it is a persistent effect, meaning it'll go on the side of the board if passed, and will remain that way for the rest of the game. Then, on this section down here, it kind of indicates where the votes come from. Proposals start at popular support, voting begins with the chairman, and then how you calculate votes. Votes equal shipyards plus factories plus money spent. That's to say that blue collar workers control the vote. And so if you own factories or shipyards, you will have more strength in passing or shooting down these laws. So starting with the chairman and then going clockwise from where that player is sitting, each player will have a chance to vote. And if after everyone votes, the result is higher than zero, the law passes. At that point, this card is sat on the right side of the board, which is important, it's not on the discard pile, and that notes that this law is in effect for the rest of the game. If it fails, meaning it's zero or below after everyone votes, this card will be discarded, which will cause the law not to be in effect and it will change the price of goods until another card ends up in the discard pile. So really the only things I didn't go over are share prices, how you fill vacancies within the company, and promise cubes. The first two, the manual does a very good job of covering, so I'm not gonna touch on that here. The last one, Promise Cubes, is a little esoteric, 
Essentially, it's another form of currency in the game that you trade between other players. Uh, it's a little hard to describe and get into without you having played the game. Just know that they are important and the rulebook also covers those to some end, but understanding it is going to require you playing the game once or twice. Alright, that's John Company. That's all of it. I did not go over every tiny detail. You will probably have to reference the rulebook now and again, but this should at least get you going. And if you have any questions or concerns come up, the rulebook should be able to provide answers to those. Um, it's a very fun game. It's a great game. It's heavy on negotiation. There is strategy. I know it can at first seem like the game sort of plays itself in some way, but like I said earlier, everything connects to something else. You might be a ship purchaser and you have to purchase ships and you don't even get to choose where they go. But the people's ships that you buy, the amount of money that can funnel into the ships purchasing, you do have a lot of agency over pieces of the game that you won't immediately see. But trust me, it's there. Every, every office in this game has something that they can do to kind of affect not only the company, but leverage the, the resulting actions to their own personal gain. Which is, of course, the point. You know, you want to get points to win the game. Anyway, go play John Company. Hopefully this has been helpful and this has been able to ease you into the game uh, when you do go play it. So yeah, enjoy it.